Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back WSWA President and CEO, Craig Wolf. As you can uh, probably tell, after three days of nonstop action, I'm feeling a bit, well, funky, right? <laughs> so, good morning. I hope you enjoyed our latest uh, video production. Um, last year, for our 71st uh, convention, I got to play Secret Agent 0071. And this year, I stood in for a pop icon, Bruno Mars, albeit a much uh, older, uh, much less nimble, and certainly much less talented Bruno Mars. Now, I enjoy making these videos, but as much fun as it was, I don't guess there's much of a future for it, uh, for me in that industry. So it's a good thing I still have my day job. It's the best job in the world, and I enjoy leading a venerable and influential 72-year-old trade association representing family-owned distributors of wine and spirits from across the country. We like to have fun at the convention and with our convention videos because our industry brings joy and fun to life's special and memorable occasions. Abraham Lincoln, in his first inaugural address, talked about the struggle between our desire to do what is right and the darker side of human nature. He said that the shadows of our own desires stand between us and our better angels. People in this country largely have a positive view of our industry because our industry over the past 82 years has taken very seriously our obligation to be a responsible industry and to follow the better angels of our nature, right? But that obligation is also being reinforced by a strong system of regulation that helps ensure that our darker angels are not allowed to run free in the absence of our self-control. That system, the three-tiered regulated license system, did not just materialize out of the ether. It was a unique experiment in alcohol regulation, consciously and carefully constructed, with the failed experiment that was prohibition fresh on the minds of policymakers at the time, as well as the failure of the vertically integrated system and the socially irresponsible system that, dis that it preceded it uh, at that time. So, there are three tiers for a reason. To prevent the dominance and subjugation of the retail tier by the supplier tier, and today, vice versa. We are a licensed and regulated industry for a reason as well. Because to ensure accountability, those who seek to engage in the sale and distribution of beverage alcohol must know that a license is a privilege, not a right, and that with the privilege of participation comes the concurrent responsibility to abide by the laws and regulations that are imposed on licensees. And because without adequate oversight and control, there is no compelling disincentive preventing violations of the governing rules. George Santayana, is the famed author of the aphorism, those who, will who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I'm sure many of you have heard this over and over again. While prohibition, as well as the tied house evils that led to prohibition, ended long time ago, long before today's industry leaders got their start, wholesalers have never forgotten that dark episode in American history. And they and WSWA have worked tirelessly over the years to remind and educate elected officials, regulators, the courts, the media, the general public, and even their fellow industry partners about that painful period of history and about why the system created in response to that history was and is necessary and just as relevant today as it was in 1933. Unfortunately, many others have either forgotten that history, they seem to believe that our industry is somehow immune from the types of problems that prevailed at that time, or they are so driven by the desire for growth and power, our darker angels, that they don't care about the potentially dangerous forces they are unleashing. The dangers we face today are, however, compounded because many are seeking to undermine the very system that was designed to contain those baser forces. So what am I talking about? Let's start with attacks on the three-tier model. The most direct assaults are coming from large retailers today. Close to $30 million was spent in a multi-year effort to force suppliers to go direct to the retail trade in Washington state. A similar battle has been brewing in Oregon for the past two years. And legislation has been proposed and lawsuits have been filed in order to increase the number of licenses excuse me, available to large retail chains. Now, to their credit, 
the proponents of these changes have not ignored the laws, and they are using legal means to achieve their goals. But what are their goals, and are they truly in the best interest of the industry writ large? Well, their goals are pretty simple, right? They're applying their considerable resources in an effort to monopolize the retail marketplace, replace or limit the role of wholesalers, and ultimately to dictate the terms of trade to the supplier tier. Should they succeed in these efforts, they will ultimately overwhelm and destroy the independent retail trade, and as they are in the process, exactly as they're doing in Washington State right now, and weaken or destroy the wholesale tier. And in that scenario, the consumer loses, because without a strong wholesale tier and a diverse retail trade, shelf space will inevitably be lost, and SKUs will be restricted. WSWA supports all of its members' retail partners and wants them all to be successful. But we will continue to oppose legislation, ballot initiatives, and legal actions that are designed to alter the balance of power between the tiers, or which would allow any one player to aggrandize too much power within the system. Now then there are the challenges to the licensed, regulated system itself. Let's start with the fact that at both the federal and state levels, regulatory budgets have been cut precipitously across the country. Now, why is that a problem? Because without adequate funding for things like formula and label approvals, industry innovation is undermined and limited. And without funding for enforcement and oversight, companies will come to believe the rules just don't apply to them anymore, or at least there is no cost for noncompliance. And there will be chaos in the marketplace. The good news, at least on the federal level, is that the industry is unified across all three tiers and across all segments that additional funding is needed for the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, for TTB. Recently, and for a second time in a year, a letter reflecting that concern, coordinated by WSWA and signed by associations representing wineries, distillers and breweries, as well as importers, wholesalers and retailers, was sent to Capitol Hill expressing our concerns. The bad news is that where states have had the resource to act and hold licensees accountable, licensees have tried to argue that basic licensing rules don't apply to them. For example, when the New York State Liquor Authority threatened Empire Wine with sanctions for illegal cross-border sales to consumers in other states, Empire argued that the rule that licensees in New York not engage in improper conduct is too vague somehow to support a legal action. Look, let's be clear. If a persistent and intentional violation of the laws of another state is not improper conduct, I don't know what is. Perhaps more offensive, however, than the illegal acts of Empire are the protestations of organizations ostensibly representing Empire and other retail licensees that, when boiled down to their essence, essentially assert that laws they don't like should not be binding on their members. And just imagine if I were to stand up here and argue that state and federal laws relating to slotting fees should not be binding on my members because I believe they are anachronistic and, well, just because I don't like them, right? Can you imagine the reaction? Even more offensive is the reaction of certain members of the New York legislature who have introduced legislation designed to restrict the ability of the NYSLA to hold its licensees accountable for such violations. The message they are communicating by introducing this legislation is that New York does not respect the laws of other states, and that the laws of other states are fine as far as they go, but you know they're not going to apply to our licensees as long as they don't get caught. That's not a good thing. The ironic thing about all this is that the legislators in New York are aware that New York is engaged in a lawsuit against UPS and FedEx for illegal shipments of tobacco into their state and the failure of those entities to pay taxes on those shipments. So while those New York legislators understand that illegal cross-border sales of controlled substances from out of the state can create havoc in the receiving state and a great deal of lost revenue, they feel comfortable trying to give their own licensees a pass for the same type of conduct. I have to say that I'm, I'm a little bit disturbed as well by the silence of the regulatory community in the face of these blatantly illegal sales, as well as that of the rest of the license industry. And I have communicated that to my peers as well as to the uh, NCSLA and NAPCA. Let me add that I'm not making an argument about the pros and cons of direct shipment laws here um, you know, for either the licensed wineries or for retailers. A number of states allow both types of direct shipping. Rather, I'm talking about adherence to the existing law. That should not be a controversial proposition. Look, if you don't like a law, work to change it through the legislative process. But disregarding the laws you don't like is irresponsible and is ultimately a recipe for disaster for our industry. 
WSWA has been public in its support for the rights of states like New York to hold its licensees accountable for violations of the law, and we encourage other industry associations and the regulatory community to follow suit. Another critical issue we are facing is the marijuana legalization movement. Many in the legalization movement have tried to demonize alcohol relative to marijuana as part of their legalization strategy. This type of rhetoric is irresponsible as well. And given the lack of in-depth research into both the short-term and long-term effects of marijuana is based entirely on speculation. In fact, the most recent research by NHTSA, the Roadside Survey of Alcohol and Drug Use by Drivers, found that the number of drivers with alcohol in their system has declined by nearly one-third since 2007 and by more than three-quarters since the first roadside survey in 1973. But that same survey found a large increase in the number of drivers using marijuana and other illegal substances. In the 2014 survey, nearly one in four drivers tested positive for at least one drug that could affect the safety of drivers on the road. Our members and our industry as a whole understand that abuse of our products can cause harm and we work hard to be very socially responsible. That's the reason underage drinking has declined and drunk driving fatalities have remarkably declined over the past decade. Now, WSWA is neutral on the issue of marijuana legalization. However, we do believe that those who seek marijuana legalization will be better served talking about their understanding of the need to be a responsible industry, and they should be effectively regulated. And WSWA certainly takes the position that if a state considers legalization of marijuana, policymakers should use the licensed regulated three-tier system as a model for the type of system they should use to ensure accountability, tax collection, prevention of underage access, and to ensure product integrity as well. In fact, we have recommended to state governors and attorneys general that they look to our system for guidance when faced with the possibility of legalization so they can avoid the type of problems that we're already seeing in states that have legalized marijuana without putting in those adequate controls. Moreover, at the federal level, we believe that every rule that applies to alcohol should apply with equal force to marijuana. So, if there is a .08 drunk driving standard tied to a state's highway funds, there should be a standard set for marijuana that is comparable and similarly restrictive. If there's a 21-year drinking age for alcohol tied to a state's highway funds, the same should apply to marijuana. And if there are stringent labeling rules for alcohol, they should apply with equal force to marijuana as it is legalized, and so on. As with the TTB funding issue, I believe the industry is absolutely unified on the need to ensure that the marijuana industry be properly regulated and taxed, and we'll work hard together going forward to ensure that appropriate action is taken to achieve that goal. Now, while we face many, many challenges, those I have touched on and many that time constraints don't permit me to talk about today, WSWA's membership and the beverage alcohol industry as a whole can rest assured that WSWA's members will work hard to follow the better angels of our nature, and we will continue to advocate for policies that encourage balance among the tiers and accountability and social responsibility. And our members can also rest assured knowing that they are represented by a team of experienced and ethical professionals that are a credit to them and to the association and who are dedicated to ensure their continued success. Thank you.